Okay, can everyone hear me? And is this working? It's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I just want to acknowledge the Wurja people of the Noongar Nation, traditional custodians of the land on which this church is built, and I respect their leaders. And I also want to acknowledge Pastors Keith and Stephanie Truscott from the Mount Zion Aboriginal Christian Fellowship that are here with us this morning. And I especially want to acknowledge my nephew David, who has promised he is going to be watching this online on YouTube later, but you'll hear more about him later. We're looking at the Book of Lamentations, and I want to start with a story. There was a Bible college student in Queensland many, many years ago. He was very poor. He really only had his Bible, his books for Bible college, and a very sad, broken old motorcycle. That's all he had. He would ride it frequently and it would break and he would have to stop and fix the motorcycle on the side of the road before he could complete his journey. So he was at Bible College one day and uh, as many of you would know, you have devotions at Bible College and they read a, uh, a letter from missionaries in New Guinea and they were saying, please send us some money. Pray that somebody could send us some money because we need a vehicle to help with our building work. We're spending a, a lot of time working and then walking to the supplies and then picking up something and then walking all the way back. If we had a vehicle, we could just pick it all up at once and we could complete our project so much quicker. Well, the Bible college student thought, well, that's okay, I can pray. I don't have any money anyway, so I can pray, that's all right. But God told him, send that motorcycle to New Guinea. So, mm, that doesn't make sense. And he told me this story. It's a true story. He told me. It's as though you and I were talking. God told me directly, send the motorcycle to New Guinea. He told him a second time. And he said, God, how can this possibly work? They need a vehicle, not a motorcycle. And my motorcycle is broken. It would be more trouble than it's worth. And a third time, God said, send the motorcycle to New Guinea. Okay, okay. I'll send it to New Guinea. But you've got to help me. I don't have any money to send it anyway. And over the next couple of weeks and months, God in miraculous ways provided parts. Uh, people would just give him parts for a motorcycle or he'd find things on the side of the road that he could use to repair the motorcycle. There was also um, work. He, he might get like a day's work out of Bible college and he'd just get just the right amount of money to be able to buy the next part to fix the motorcycle. And finally, the motorcycle was in tip-top condition and it was right to go. And then God provided somebody at his church who was willing to give him some scrap lumber and some workshop tools so he was actually able to build a crate to put the motorcycle in and he did that. And then the man who provided the, the wood for the crate actually gave him the money and said, I don't know why, but God's telling me to give you this amount of money now. And so he took it down to the wharf and uh, he put it on the ship and that was the exact right amount of money for the ship to New Guinea. Praise God. And the people at the shipyard said, look, um, do you want to purchase insurance? And the guy just said, look, God's got this. It's okay. If you knew the story to get to this point, you would know God's got this. It's, it's okay. I don't need insurance. I couldn't pay for it anyway. So imagine his surprise a couple of weeks later when they get the next letter from Papua New Guinea and they said, thank you for the student who sent the motorcycle to us. Unfortunately, the crate slipped from the sling as they were unloading it and it smashed on the wharf and it was destroyed. We appreciate that. Well, what does the Bible College student do then? He was so certain he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do, but it didn't work. Now I wonder, and this is just my own wondering, I wonder if the writer of Lamentations, if it was in fact Jeremiah, which it probably was, if it was Jeremiah, I wonder if he actually felt the same way. 
God, you called me to be a prophet. You called me to come and warn the people. I've done everything you asked me to do faithfully. Even the stuff, you know, laying on the ground for however long and then rolling over, laying on the ground again. Even digging a hole in his wall and climbing out through the wall in the middle of the night with his backpack. Do you think he was fun to live next door to? I did all of that, but you, nobody listened. Judgment still came on the nation. I wonder if Jeremiah actually felt a bit like that. I did what you told me to, but it didn't work. Well, I'll tell you more about these people later, but that's the Hadfields. They've been ministering to the Indigenous people out in the, um, uh, Kanana, but it's about 180 kilometres east of Kalgoorlie. That's the Western Desert people. Now, the title of the sermon series this morning is It's OK Not To Be OK. Personally, I have a big problem with the title of the sermon series because it's a little bit like saying it's good not to be good or it's bad not to be bad. It's a self-contradicting statement and any self-contradicting statement cannot be true. It's like me saying, I'm Stephen, but I'm not Stephen. What does that mean? It's nonsense. But I've heard it from other people before. I've heard people talk about it's okay not to be okay. There's got to be some sense to it and this is the sense in which I take it. C.S. Lewis talks about the law of undulation, that in our lives we have some ups and downs and everybody has ups and downs in their life and as long as we are human beings in our mortal bodies, we will have ups and downs through our life. So if you're below that centre line, I mean this is a sine wave, but if you're below that centre line you might be feeling a bit low. And other times you'll be feeling really good. Now I'll just stop here and say, if you're not okay and it's an ongoing condition and it's a depressive sort of condition, that's okay. Get help. Please feel free. Get help. Talk to somebody. There are legitimate, diagnosable medical conditions that can make you feel not okay and there are legitimate medical help that is available. But everybody goes through it and you would expect life to go through this, but life's actually a bit more complex than that. There's many different factors in our lives, internal factors, external factors, and so you can have lots of ups and downs in lots of different areas in your life. So what you can end up with is something like this where you've got ups, downs, high highs, low lows, and you feel good and bad all in the same time in different areas of your life. So I'll take it to mean it's okay in the long term if from time to time you feel not okay in the short term. And therefore, that is not a self-contradicting statement. It's actually talking about the difference between the bigger picture and momentary feelings. Mm. So this is where we come into the book of Lamentations. So uh, assuming it's Jeremiah, he's in the middle of the rubble that is Jerusalem. He's thinking, wow, I, I wish they had listened. But in the midst of his suffering, and thank you to Rachel and Helen for reading the whole passage, all 66 verses, you get the, get the perspective that he's suffering, he's suffering greatly. And this is just the first half. He's talking about his personal experience of pain and suffering. There's physical pain, but there's also the word darkness appears a number of times. Maybe there's something affecting his vision. I don't know. He's talking about darkness. He mentions arrows a few times as well. And it's not just the, the sort of bow and arrows targeting things or uh, uh, hunting animals. If it was written today, it would probably not say arrows. It would probably say bullets. And the bullets are actually coming towards him, not around him. And he even says that your bullets, God, God, his bullets have pierced my heart. It's as though he's in the throes of dying. He's just been shot through the heart. And it's not just the physical pain. There's emotional suffering that he's going through too. He's being mocked by the people around him. He's suffering. He's lost the hope that he had. He's got expectations. They're all gone. What I thought of oh, my God would provide, they're gone. And in the midst of that, it finishes at the end of verse 21 with, Yet this I call to mind. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions 
never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Now in a couple of verses' time, he follows with this. For, the Lord, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. Now where does this hope come from? Where does this belief in an almighty and all-powerful and all-loving God come from when he's sitting in the ruins of a city? The city, as the Bible Project pointed out, was the, was the, the prophecy of everything that was to come and they thought that they had it. They've got this city, they've got this great temple, just waiting for God down. Where does the hope come from? Well, have a look at this. This is the first three verses of Lamentations chapter 3. You may notice in your Bible, if you've got the, the, the old-fashioned Bibles with the little symbols and squiggly lines all the way through the passage, you may notice that there's a lot of squiggly lines in the book of Lamentations. Look at these quotes. Now, admittedly, two of the quotes are from Jeremiah, and they may be self-fulfilling quotes, or quotes from the same author, so you don't put them in the same category as quotes from all these other books in the Bible. He's got eight quotes, six from different books of the Bible, different parts of the Bible, in the first three verses. This is a man who wrote, whoever wrote this book, is a man who had significant understanding of the Bible, had read the Bible a lot, so that when he saw the circumstances around him of the fallen city, he was able to put those together with the prophecies that had fulfilled that, or that had predicted that. And then he was able to create this whole book of Lamentations. This isn't just in the first three verses. I'm a bit of a geek for this sort of thing, so the numbers are a little bit rubbery. Please accept my, my counting quickly. Um, but it's in the order of 500, more than 500 quotes from other parts of the Bible are found in the book of Lamentations. It's only got five chapters. So he's able to find those bits that are fit with what he sees going on and he's able to say that this was all predicted like he has in chapter 2. God's justice. This is divine wrath. This is God's justice that's been completely predicted. But then the hope comes from finding all the other bits in the books that he knows and he reads to know about God's mercy. His mercies never fail. They are new every morning. How great is your faithfulness. So the only way he can put God's mercy and God's divine justice together is to have this passage in chapter 3 where I don't know where this help is coming from. I don't know where the hope is coming from. I can't see it, but I trust that God is faithful, that he does have a, a hope for us, a future for us, that he will not cast us off forever. And the contrast, of course, is the very end of the chapter 5 where he says... Um, have you rejected us totally forever? Now, I, I can't put myself in his position. I haven't suffered like him, but I can only think that from his perspective in the middle of the suffering, it didn't appear that there was any sort of physical hope for the children of Israel at that point. Anyway, so whoever wrote the Book of Lamentations has a very good understanding of the scripture. And so I would su suggest to all of us that if we want to be able to have hope in hard times, we need to have a very good understanding of scripture. Now, if you're having good times, praise God, read the Bible. If you're having very bad times, if you're at the bottom of one of these undulations that we talked about before, Read your Bible. Read your Bible like a teenager reads TikTok on their phone. Have you ever seen them? They sit there for hours at a time and scroll, scroll, scroll. Read your Bible. Cling to God's Word. Cry out to Him. 
If you're at the top of one of those, praise God. But read your Bible again, because you know the law of undulation. You will have low times as well. Now, there's lots of times where the scripture is specifically mentioned in the Bible being read. Now, uh, remember, uh, Moses at Mount Sinai, he reads the scripture to the people. And they go on from there. He gives them a new, a new covenant with God. There's Joshua when they enter the new promised land and they're about to take possession of they have, They've conquered it. They're taking possession of it. He reads them the word of God. Now, Josiah, he's a really interesting one because he came after a, a long line of kings that Paul the Bible says is they did evil in the sight of God. But he repaired the temple. While they were repairing the temple, they found the scrolls. He read the scrolls. He read the scrolls to the people. The nation repented and there was a period of revival in Judah. Then Ezra and Nehemiah, once they've come back from captivity, they've come back to establish the walls with a commission, the walls of Jerusalem with a commission from the king of Persia to re-establish Jerusalem. They read the scriptures. And Jesus, we read about him reading the scriptures in, in the New Testament. What's interesting about Jesus is that it was actually a retort that Jesus made frequently to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. You are in error because you do not know the word of God. You have not read the word. Jesus expects us to read the word. In many ways, a person's reading of God's word, and especially their application of it in their life, is a bit of a barometer for how they're going. I know that's for my life, for other people's lives too. If you have a serious, dedicated, regular habit of reading the Bible, I think that's a pretty good barometer for how you're going with God generally. Not necessarily, but it is generally. So what about these words of hope? Are they just sort of blithe goodwill or good wishes? Or is there some substance to them? Is there any truth to what he was saying about God being faithful? Well, the writer of Lamentations had no way of knowing this, but a thousand kilometres away, if you go straight across, is a little town called Hila. It's not called Hila in the Old Testament, it's called Babylon. That's where Daniel was. And at the time that this is being written, the time that this is set, Daniel is doing something truly exceptional in Babylon. You see, he's about 17 years of age. He's one of a number of young people that have been taken to be trained and then put into the king's service. At that stage, it was the king of um, Babylon. Uh, the king of Persia hadn't taken over yet. Now Daniel, in an extraordinary act of faith, has refused to eat the food that has been de uh, given to him from the king's table. Now you've got to think about this in context. He's just survived the siege of Jerusalem where you've seen the little kids sitting on the ground begging for food and the nobles eating rats. Suddenly he's put in this privileged position of being trained by the world superpower and being given the same food as the king of the world superpower. And he has said, no, I will not eat that. That's not right according to my God and how my God has told me to live. And then he goes on and says, put me to the test. Give me nothing but vegetables for 10 days and let's see how we go. And then the punchline, he's better off than everyone else who's been eating the king's food after 10 days. And then, of course, I love this last line. So the guard took away their choice food and their wine and they were to, they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Do you think that made Daniel popular with his colleagues? <laughs> I don't think so, but I don't think it mattered because Daniel was making an extraordinary step of faith. And then later on in the book of uh, chapter Daniel chapter 1, that's when God actually gives him this incredible ability of prophecy and interpreting dreams. That didn't come before his act of faith, that came after his act of faith. 
So this was going on right at the time when Jeremiah, the writer of Lamentations, is pleading with God to do something. <coughs> so where did this faith come from? Where did Daniel get this incredible faith? Well, I think you have to look at everything in context. And if you can see the timeline up there, you'll see Daniel's born in 623 BC. And of course, it's BC, so the numbers come down as we go forward. 622 was when Josiah was rebuilding the temple. He read the law and the nation repented. If you put those two together, Daniel grew up in an environment when the law was being practiced, when the nation was repenting. So we have that the temple was restored. There was the sacrifices being made. There was adherence to the law. And specifically, it mentions the reading of the scriptures. That's the environment that Daniel was growing up in. It was only the last three years when Josiah was killed in battle in uh, 609, and then the son took over, and then the brother took over from the son, and 606 when Nebuchadnezzar took over the city. It was just those last three years that Israel went, sorry, Judah went down again. That's the environment that Daniel grew up in, and it started from, I think most relevantly, reading the word. Reading the word for the king, reading the word to the community, the nation repented. That's the bedrock on which Daniel's faith was based. Now, I'm just going to close, uh, wind up here, and there's, there's a couple of points I want to make. Uh, I don't want to be pointing fingers at anybody. Uh, I, I have more than enough to point back at myself. I actually think that I've got a pretty good Bible reading habit going. I've got a, a nephew in America and we read the same chapter of the Bible uh, each day and we uh, send each other our favourite verses from it. So coming into preparing this message, I actually thought I had Bible reading pretty covered. Let me tell you about my week. I had a very busy week and a very big week. And on Friday, I had a very, very big meeting with, um, I'll just use a euphemism, a meeting with somebody who's incredibly powerful, uh, unimaginably intelligent, and painfully particular. And it was a very big meeting. It was going to last all day. Now, I had prepared all week for it. I'd stayed late, started early all week. But come Thursday night, come Friday morning, 6.15 on Friday morning, you better believe I was at my desk at work. I had a mountain of paperwork in front of me, manly cramming through, trying to find everything that I needed to know for that meeting. And at the same time, I had a, 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 a conversation, shall I call it, playing on my computer at more than uh, a time and a half. So I was playing it on fast forward. I was interpreting that while I was reading this. And I did that for uh, a good three hours before I went into that meeting at 10 o'clock. Intellectually, I was dead when I went into that meeting. But it occurred to me, I'm always looking for pithy analogies when I come up to speak. It occurred to me, have I ever in my life read the Word of God the way I was preparing for that meeting? Goodness no, nothing like it. So as much as I say we should read the Word of God, I need to reflect on myself. I need to read the Word of God. And just like Jeremiah, or the writer of Lamentations, I think if I did read the Word of God, if I did furiously study the Word like, like a teenager on TikTok, would my life look different? I think it would. If I read the word like the people of Israel read the word, would our community look different? I think it would. And if I read the word and created that environment in which young people can grow, 
Would our generations look different? I think it would. That's pretty much all I've got to say this morning, but I do want to finish with a bit of a high note. Read the Word of God, but also remember this. God's still in control. And what we know and what we see and perceive from our situation is only a tiny fraction of what's really going on. Now, why did I tell you all about this man in the 1950s at Bible College and his motorcycle? Well, that's not the end of the story. You see, from Bible College, he went out to Cundy Lee and he became a missionary out there. And 60 years later, he's still a missionary to those people, that people group. He married a wife out there, um, uh, 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 a lady who was out there as a linguist. 60 years later, they're still in Kalgoorlie. You can read their story in the Eternity newspaper from January and February of this year. It's an amazing story of faithful service to God. That's Brian and Dawn Hadfield. This isn't, of course, Brian Hadfield's photo. It's just a photo of an old guy with a motorcycle. But the end of the story is this. He went out to Cundy Lee, and for many, many years, he told me, it troubled him because he was so certain that God had told him to send that motorcycle to New Guinea and it just made no sense that he would take the motorcycle, send it to New Guinea, provide all those miracles and then just smash it on the wharf. But that wasn't the end of the story. You see, after he had graduated from Bible College and gone to Gundy Lee, the missionaries had sent another letter to the Bible College saying, praise God. You see, what had happened was the shipping company had felt bad for breaking the motorcycle. So they had called up the people in New Guinea and said, look, we're so sorry about this, we're so ashamed. What we'll do is we'll actually pay out the entire insured value of the motorcycle, even though it wasn't insured. They got that money and it was actually enough for them to buy a World War II Jeep and trailer at auction in New Guinea, which was exactly what they needed for the building project. You see, God knew that, and God knew that this was how he wanted to do it, and he also knew that Mr. Hadfield wouldn't know for years later. So when, this is actually the Grace family, you've heard of the musician Steve Grace, the Christian musician, this is his family, this was his father who wrote the letter to the Bible College. Years later, the Grace family came to Australia on furlough. And they made a point of travelling from the East Coast all the way out to Cundy Lee to meet the Hadfield family and say, isn't God great? And Mr Hadfield said, well, yes, of course. He says so in God's word. What about the motorcycle? They said, well, let's talk about the motorcycle because that was just tragic. They told him the story of how the shipping company paid out and how they were able to buy a Jeep and it met their needs perfectly. But it actually got better. Because a couple of weeks after they paid out the motorcycle, the shipping company called the people in New Guinea again and said, you know what, um, is this your motorcycle down here on the edge of the wharf? I said, well, well, we had a motorcycle, but you know, it, it, the shipping company's paid for it, it's not ours, I mean, whoever paid for it, that's it. No, 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 look, we are the shipping company, we don't want it, it's scrap, it's just getting in our way here, it's going to the rubbish tip. If you can, can you please come down and pick up the motorcycle? Well, wouldn't you believe? It was the same make of motorcycle as Mr Grace had in New Guinea. And for years after, he was able to use the parts off that motorcycle that had been sent to New Guinea to keep his own motorcycle in service because he was able to pull them off and put them on. God's faithfulness is real. God's faithfulness is everlasting even if we can't see it. If you're in a time of uh, lowness, of depression, of sadness, take comfort. Our God is faithful, even when we can't see it. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you so much for your word, Lord, and even the sad bits and the hard bits that are, the bits that are hard to understand, like lamentations. I pray that everybody here, Lord, would take what you have had to say to heart, Lord, that you would speak through the words that I've spoken, or in spite of them, Lord, both here and for the people watching online, like my nephew David in America. I pray that you would be glorified in all our lives, that we would all have a stronger faith, Lord, because we know that you are faithful, even when we can't see it. 
Help us all read your word, not just, Lord, to be readers of your word, but doers of your word too, like Jesus told us to. Commit these things to you now, in Jesus' name.